Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm so glad to see you could make it tonight as we continue this beautiful journey through the book of Daniel. It's hard to believe we're down to the end of it, but I'll tell you, this book doesn't let up. Even in the last chapter, 12, it's as powerful and as revealing and incredible as can be. But tonight, we're going to look at Daniel, the 10th chapter. Before we do, though, I would like to pray. So if you bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, you're such an awesome God. And you're so tender, loving, and kind to all of us. And we want to thank you, and we want to honor you, and we want to praise you to show our appreciation. I especially need your help, Lord, so that these thoughts will captivate and catch our attention the way you intended them to do because the Holy Spirit would present it and not me. So use me in spite of myself. Bless each one who's come, and if any are still coming, Lord, be with them too, and thank you. You always hear and always answer because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Daniel chapter 10, and we're going to look at five specific things tonight. We're going to look at the facts about the last prophecy. That's first. Secondly, we're going to look at the setting of the prophecy. Then we're going to look at the theophany. Do you know what a theophany is? Well, we're going to find out. And then we're going to look at the great controversy. And then we're going to look at the conclusion. All of this is found in Daniel, the 10th chapter. Now, the first fact I want to share with you, remind you, the last prophecy starts with the Medo-Persian Empire. Chapter 10 through 12 are one prophecy. 10 happens to be the introduction. 11 happens to be the body of the prophecy. That will be tomorrow morning at 11. By the way, anybody read Daniel 11 lately? <laughs> Go home and read it. It's very complex, but it's beautiful in what it reveals. And finally, chapter 12 is the conclusion. So let's take a look at the setting. The very first verse gives us the setting. It says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was what? It was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. Well, let's take a look at a couple elements here as we set the stage. First of all, the third year of Cyrus would be between the spring of 536 B.C. and the spring of 535 B.C. That was the time frame of his third year. Also, please notice Daniel was in his what? He was in his 90s at the time of this vision taking place. And here's an important element I want you to recognize. It starts out with, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. I looked at this in the Hebrew. You can do the same thing. The appointed time is not accurate. In other words, Instead, it says the appointed time, not the appointed time, a great conflict. This whole prophecy is about a great conflict, and it'll become clearer as we move through. So remember, instead of the appointed time, and by the way, if some of you have newer versions, you will find that it says a great conflict or a great war or a great upheaval. You'll find that. So keep that in mind. And then we move to the next slide. As we continue to look at the setting, 
And uh, verse 2 says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat, nor did I anoint myself at all till the three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now I'm going to move through these verses carefully so you have time to think about them. But I want you to notice, Daniel was mourning. In the Hebrew, that word for mourning is bewail, lament, mourn. I also want you to notice that in verse 2 and 3, right next to each other, it says three full weeks. That's what the Hebrew says, three whole weeks. It's a very interesting phrase, and we'll see why it's interesting towards the end. Also, Daniel here was practicing a partial fast. Noted he said he took no meat, no wine in his stomach, and no pleasant food, and he didn't anoint himself. But he did evidently eat and drink water. So this would be called a partial fast. Now the question arises as we look at the setting here in Daniel 10, why is he mourning? What in the world could be wrong that would cause Daniel to mourn for how many weeks? No, don't say three. Three full weeks. Yeah, that's how many days? 21 days. What in the world could possibly be? Well, if we went over to Ezra, the first chapter, and we looked at it, we would find out in the first year of Cyrus, he allowed the Jews to go back to Israel and rebuild the temple. In chapter 2, we get a list of the names who returned and who began the work in the second year. And then ver uh, chapter 3 would be the third year of Cyrus' reign, they rebuilt the temple and they began the sacrifices. Hey, praise God. Do you know how important the temple is? Do you know that God said repeatedly in the old days, this is where I put my name. And what a glorious time that must be. But by the third year and the fourth year, it came to a halt. As we look at the fourth chapter of Ezra, verse 5, look what it says, the Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans were those who were left behind when the northern kingdom of Israel was taken captive by Assyria. And what they did is they took some of their other captives from other locations where they had conquered, and they mixed them all together. And so the Samaritans came to the Israelites and said, we want to help you build the temple. And you know what they said? They said, nope. And it wasn't because they're cruel, nasty, seclusive. It was because they knew that their worship style was a mixture of truth and error. And they went into captivity because of the idolatry that was brought into Jerusalem. And so they said, no. Well, look at this. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, folks. The building of the temple came to a halt from 536 B.C. to 522 B.C. because they, their purpose, uh, it says, to frustrate the purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, and even until the reign of Darius the Persian. That's why he was mourning, fasting, and praying. By the way, I want to just mention this, you know, this is still relevant today, fasting and praying. Humbling yourself before God and wait till you see what happened because he humbled himself before God. But now we know why he was mourning and lamenting and bewailing. 
because the work came to a halt. Well, let's look at what happened next. And I love this. Daniel 10, check this out, folks. He's lamenting, he's mourning, he's fasting, he's praying, and look what happens now in the 24th day of the first month. So if we get three full weeks, three full weeks, this must be at the end of that 21st day, or the, the 21st day. As I was standing by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose waist was girded with, a gold, with the gold of Euphas. His body was like beryl, his face an appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and his feet of burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words were like the voice of a multitude. Who in the world could that be? Well, we're going to see it's Jesus. There's absolutely no doubt about it in the Bible. This isn't Gabriel, this is Jesus. 21 days he was fasting, and what happens? Jesus himself appeared to him, a theophany, the appearance of God himself. And this is really cool as we look at this, for I want you to know somebody else had a theophany. Look what Revelation 1.12 says. John says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, one like the Son of Man, get this now, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded with the chest of a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, his, white as snow, his eyes like flame of fire, his feet like fine bronze as it is refined in the furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters. Now, if some of you go, well, wait a minute, he must have superimpose that from Daniel and put Revelation. No. Da John saw the very same thing that Daniel did. God cares about his people. And if it's necessary, he will show up. But he shows up when we seek him fervently. But I'm amazed at how our God is willing to condescend at any time in which we have a need. And so right there in the very first chapter of Revelation, we find out the same thing happened to John. Well, let's continue here as we look at this vision. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision. Therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision, no strength remained in me, for my big vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength, yet I heard the sounds of his word, which I heard the sounds of his word. I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Ah. I wondered what I would do if God appeared to me. What Daniel did is he fell on his face. And when Moses discovered who that was in the burning bush, he fell on his face. But there's somebody else that fell on his face. And you can guess it. In the first chapter of the book of Revelation, here's what happened when John saw what he saw, which is the same thing that Daniel saw. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. Wow. Folks, I got to say something here before I go on. You got to understand. This isn't because it was Daniel or because it was John. 
It was because they were seeking God. So don't look at me and don't let me look at you and say, well, I'm not Daniel. I'm not John. Because God's reactions to our seeking him are the same for everybody. And so John fell as a dead man, just like Daniel did. Suddenly, a hand touched me. By the way, didn't we just read that a hand touched him and said, do not be afraid? Now we're back to Daniel 10. Suddenly, verse 10, a hand touched me. Daniel's telling us, touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. Verse 11, and he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And while he was speaking these words to me, I stood trembling. And again, I go back to what I already said. I tried to figure out what I would be like if God appeared to me. And I already think I know the answer because of the Bible. What a beautiful vision and condescension that God would appear to his people when they needed him the most. And look what he said. He didn't only touch him. He then spoke to him and said the same words he said to John. What are they? Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Verse 12, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. When were they heard? No, no. Immediately. Immediately, well, you can say, okay, well, how come he had to do this for 21 days and be in such stress and pressure and anxiety? And we're, we'll see that. Humble yourself before God. Your words were heard, and I have come because of your prayer. But the prince of the king of Persia withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. Okay, so now we get an idea we don't quite understand yet, but he had to fast and pray 21 days because Gabriel was with the prince of, of, uh, of the king of Persia. Hmm, interesting. And that king of Persia, the prince of the king of Persia, withstood him 21 days until Michael showed up. And now I have come to you, Gabriel tells. Then he said to him, he said it again, fear not, Daniel. Oh, I'm repeating this. Check this out. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you prayed to me and humbled yourself, your words were heard. I wanted to emphasize this, and I have come because of your words. You got that? Two times. Your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. And for that, you can replace it with prayer. But the prince of the king of Persia, who is the prince of the king of Persia, withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, who is Michael? One of the chief princes, it says here, came to help me, for I had been left alone with the king of Persia. All right, now I have come to you to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days? Now this prophecy is reaching down to you and I. 
For you see, in the Old Testament, his people were the Jews. But in the New Testament, the Jews are the church. The Israel of God and prophecy is the church. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. And when he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face towards the ground and became speechless. And suddenly, one having the likeness of the Son of Man touched my lips. I have retained no strength, he said. By the way, before we came up here, Pastor was praying with me, and he happened to turn to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, got, uh, the angel, touched Jeremiah's lips. And of course, in the book of Isaiah, the angel touched Isaiah's lips. What a personal, intimate, loving God we have. That's why we make sacrifices to worship. That's why we make sacrifices to live like he did because he went through it for us and he doesn't leave us down even though it may appear that way. Verse 16, and suddenly one having the likeness of the Son of Man touched my lips and I have retained no strength. For now, how could this Servant of my Lord, talk with you, my Lord. As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. And then again, the one having the likeness of the Son of Man touched me and strengthened me. Uh, by the way, are you getting a pattern here? Okay, well, all right, we'll move on. And he said, oh, man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you, be strong, yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And then he said, do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come, but I will tell you what is noted in the scriptures of truth. No one upholds me in this battle except Michael, your prince. All right, so let's get some facts straight here as we look at the conclusion. First of all, notice how the theophany affected Daniel and John. Such a glorious vision, they fell on their faces. And when they spoke, they trembled and feared. Because both of those visions said the voice of a multitude to Daniel, and in Revelation it says the vo voice of many waters. The second thing I want you to notice is how Gabriel touched Daniel how, how many times? He touched him three times. How persistent of, of, of Gabriel to assure Daniel. And notice he touched John also. Number three, the angel called Daniel man greatly beloved twice. And number four, he told Daniel about the great controversy, the battle between good and evil. I could have put Christ and Satan. Let's look at this more closely, folks, in case you missed it. The prince of Persia or the prince of Greece are demons, Satan, fighting to keep control of the kings to oppose God's people. How do we know that? Well, remember, Gabriel said, now I got to leave because I got to do some more battle. The king of Persia is holding out. Remember that because the Samaritans complained, the, the, the work on the temple came to a halt. 
Daniel started praying, and Gabriel shot over there and began to struggle with them. But the prince of Persia, of course, showed up. And if you're worried about the prince of Persia, I've even seen some commentators look at that, and they call it the, the son of the king. That's who the prince is, and they're fighting. But you see, in the New Testament, Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world. Mm-hmm. And so we get our first glimpse in the scripture graphically portraying that there is a physical battle going on between good and evil. And guess who the objects of that battle are? Us. Secondly, I want you to know that Michael, now that we know the prince of Persia or the prince of Greece, Michael is the is Jesus' battle name. Check these texts out. First of all, Revelation 12, 7. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Now, let me stop just for a second, because I will admit to you this is a bit controversial. Some people take the literal, where it says the, Michael the archangel, for example. He's an angel. No, that's not Jesus. Well, let me tell you something. Who do you think is the only person that could throw the dragon and his angels out of heaven? Another angel? So we see Michael in combat with Satan. But let's go on just in case. In Daniel 10, 13, which we just looked at, and and verse 21, where it said, I must return to fight and only... Gabriel is there to assist me in this battle. Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me. No one opposes against these, against the prince of Persia, except Michael, your prince. And finally, 12-1, which we're going to get to tomorrow night at this very same time. And at that time, Michael stands up, the great prince who stands, oh, watch over your people, the sons of your people. And here again, hold it. When we get through the great conflict that is described in Daniel chapter 11, we get to the end of that chapter. It moves right into the beginning of 12. And there we find out the solution to this great battle that ends on the note that the king of the north moves out to annihilate God's people, it then says, Michael stands up. Can't be an angel. Why? Because stands up means that he's beginning to take his proper place. And no angel can stand up against Satan except Jesus. Ah, but I got a better one than that. As we look at Jude 9, have you ever read this? Yet Michael the archangel contended with the devil when he disputed over the body of Moses. Have you sat down and thought about this? I sat there one day and it dawned on me, wait a minute, disputed over the body means he was dead. And Michael came to get him. And, of course, Satan showed up and said, hey, man, this guy smote the rock twice. He's, he's no different than me. He's not allowed in heaven. Michael proceeded to resurrect him. What did Jesus say? I am the resurrection and the life. No angel can resurrect a dead person. All who are in the grave will hear my voice, and they will come forth. Yes, my friends, Michael is the combat name of Jesus, and it's always mentioned when he's in direct conflict. And listen what it says. If you didn't think about 1 Thessalonians 4, 4, 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Oh, see, this is an archangel. 
But it says that the Lord himself, who is Jesus, descends from heaven. He shouts. He has the voice of the archangel. He has the trumpet of God. Can't be an angel. By the way, I thought you want to know that ark, that word in the Greek, archaea, to be first in political rank or power, reign, rule, over. Arche, it comes from the Greek word arche, which means commencement or beginning. So if you trip over this archangel thing, Jesus is the first of all the angels because he created them. He's the archangel. He's the one that called them into existence. John says nothing that was made, nothing was made, nothing, everything was made by him and nothing was made that was made without him. That's what it says. And so, folks, we got Michael coming. Whenever there's combat going on, Michael's present. You don't see him. I don't see him. You may be praying for years now and thinking no one's listening. And we see here that for 21 days, Daniel persisted and it paid off. Don't give up. Don't give in. These prophetic chapters of the book of Daniel are written for the last day. By the way, we're going to see that one 24 hours from now, tomorrow night. And so we've got to hold on to these stories and realize that God is working out his will according to what's good for everybody, but he never lets us down. Well, let's take a look at till three whole weeks. In the Hebrew, whole is the Hebrew for weeks of days. Okay, so let's look at weeks of days. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. This should thrill your heart. Both John's vision and Daniel's vision that he wrote in 10, 11, 12, and John wrote the book of Revelation occurred on the Sabbath. Both of them. For we know of Revelation 1, verse 10 says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And folks, now they're saying Lord's Day is a representation of Sunday, and they call it the Lord's Day. That's a day of resurrection. When John wrote this in the first century, towards the end of the first century, nobody called Sunday the Lord's Day. The only Lord's Day there is is Mark 2:26 that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And I, I just wanted to put this in there. It's one of those Heidi thoughts, I think, that once in a while I get. John 1, 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. My commandments. That includes the seventh-day Sabbath. Because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. So as we look at the relationship between John and the book of Revelation and Daniel in the book of Daniel, they both had their visions. The last one that Daniel had on the Sabbath and John had that whole book of Revelation on the Lord's Day. But I'm not done. Both Daniel and John were elderly at the time of their visions. In fact, you know what age they were approximately? Both were approximately the same age in their 90s. But look at number four. Both were exiled when they received their visions. John on the Isle of Patmos and Daniel in Babylon. Both of their visions were apocalyptic about last day things. That's a, that's a real cool theological term to impress you. I'm surprised I can pronounce it. 
folks, it means about the last days. And finally, both experienced a theophany. Both had a vision of God. And so God is trying to describe to us, folks, and illuminate our minds to understand the relationship between the two. The similarities between the two. You've got to study both of them. Daniel illuminates Revelation. Revelation illuminates Daniel. And we see these six similar things to show you that beautiful relationship. So when we get to Daniel 10, folks, there's two stately heavenly beings that are there fighting for the people. One is Gabriel, the other is Jesus. Now Gabriel, we believe to be the person, the angel who took Lucifer's place when he rebelled against God. In fact, these two remain in chapter 11, and you will see the last chapter. There is Jesus and Michael, or, or Jesus and Gabriel still. So, folks, we got a great God. And remember this. Try to look, let's see, what do you say? You can't discern the trees from the forest. Don't let the beasts and the symbols of prophecy scare you. Every prophecy, and if you approach it this way, every prophecy is about Jesus Christ. And if you approach it that way, you'll see. And when we go tomorrow morning, that'll come very clear as we look at all of this. So my friend, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I ask you to do it. Because he won't let you down like this world will, like even friends will. And so make that decision. Don't hesitate. I am so thankful I made that decision. And my desire is with the help of the Holy Spirit to continue to make that decision till Jesus comes. Let us pray. Father, I would thank you for each person who's come, for all those that are watching and listening. In fact, I remember very clearly Revelation says, blessed is he who hears and who reads the things in this book. And again, we clearly see your incredible condescension, love, and mercy towards us. Help us to be more like you and continue to reveal to us the secrets that are in the Bible that even the most intellectual human beings don't understand or get wrong. Your people will know. And thank you for hearing this prayer answering it. Now dismisses with your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.